Hello class, here's part two of sound isolation. A lot of this is going to be focusing on double leaf partitions. So by double leaf partitions would be anything where we have one leaf, an airspace that may or may not be filled with some kind of sound absorptive material, and then another leaf on the other side. So an insulated metal panel might be a good example of that, or say just a, a wall in architecture and you know, the way your home, or this is probably a commercial building because it has metal studs, but that type of thing, we have a massive layer, cavity with insulation, and then massive layer. So the, we looked at the figure like this for the single leaf. We have another one here from the reading assignment. It's for the double leaf. It, there are a lot of similarities. It's more complicated. So we have two moving panels and the, the distance in between them is critical and the material in between them too. Diving into this a little more, we have three regions like we did before. In, in this case, all three regions are going to be important. In, in the other case, we have um, one resonance frequency. We had the region below and we had the region above. Here we have three regions with two important resonance frequencies and then another repeating resonance frequency that is less important, but we will talk about it a little bit. So in this, re we have region one, which would be the low frequencies. That's everything below the mass, airspace mass resonance. Then we have region two. And here the, the two different sides are kind of working like almost like two individual ones. Um, that goes up to the cavity depth resonance. And then above that, we have region three. We're going to talk about all those in more detail here soon. Let's, let's start with that mass airspace mass resonance. Now, in some cases, this is a hugely critical thing. I'm, I've been working on a project last week or two where focusing on this. I'll say a little bit more about this when we get to the, the triple leaf thing later. But this mass, airspace mass resonance, it, if you're not aware of it, it can really bite you. <laughs> Let's say that. I'll explain that more soon, but, um, so let's, let's talk about this resonance. So you have an air between surface plates. So it's mass, air, that air kind of acts like a spring. It's like a mass spring mass. So you say that here acts as a spring. So th there's a resonance like this, just like any kind of mass spring system. And it significantly reduces the sound isolation. At whatever frequency this occurs, sound is just allowed to pass through unimpeded. The reading assignment gives you this equation, and this will work. And this might be how to get to a more accurate answer if you know the density of the material and the speed of sound in that medium in between the, the two surfaces. So those are important. And then the depth of the cavity is important. Like we said, that depth is critical. And then the mass of the, the two sides is critical. I want to give you this equation. It, it's essentially the same thing. We just have uh, this A that accounts for the characteristic, well, characteristic imped impedance is the density times the speed of sound. Here we have density times the speed of sound squared. So that term we replace with an A out here. And then we have a range of numbers 
that we put in depending on if that cavity is filled with absorption or not. So if, if you know all the details on the density and the speed of sound in your insulation, then maybe you should use that other equation. But this one I've compared to a lot of data from various tests and I've come up with numbers within these ranges that work pretty well. So I typically use 60 if there's fibrous sound absorption in the cavity and 75 if not. But that, that simplifies things. You only have like a question of does it have insulation or not and then you have the depth and the two masses. You can determine that resonance frequency. I have a calculator. It's something I need to calculate often. Um, maybe I'll remember to show you that at some point. So that resonance, like we said, it just allows sound to pass through at that frequency. And this is a pretty low frequency. So there's often cases where that resonance is low enough that it just doesn't matter. And, and actually, I should say that differently. That, that is the goal. You want to have that resonance low enough that it's not going to cause problems for the frequency range that you're interested in. So say you're just interested in speech privacy. If you have a partition where that mass airspace mass resonance is below 100 hertz, that's probably a good design. The we're going to learn about the sound transmission coefficient eventually. That is a single number rating that, based on all these different transmission losses, it quantifies the amount of isolation uh, an assembly will provide. And for architectural stuff where you're separating multifamily resonances, that's part of the building code. And that whole metric doesn't even look at anything below 100 hertz. 100 hertz is the bottom of it. So if you're, if you're just designing for speech privacy between two offices or between two units of multifamily housing, then it might be fine just to have something that has a good STC rating. And um, likely that means that the resonance is below 100 hertz. But if instead you were working on something where you had a lot of low frequency content, like you had music being played, or there's a movie theater, or say it was a mechanical room with a, a big air handling unit, or an electrical room with a big transformer, something like that. Something that's producing a lot of low frequency noise. In that case, then you don't want to just look at that STC that only considers 100 hertz and above. You, you might want to consider all the way down to 20 hertz, you know, the bottom end of what humans can typically hear. So simply determining that mass airspace mass resonance and pushing it down to a lower frequency is something that you could come across regularly come across that all the time. I mentioned the triple leaf effect, and this is where we're going to talk about that. So triple, so here, this is a pretty robust assembly. It's um, not the greatest. You'd probably have a couple layers if you were doing some higher end multifamily housing, but just this with two by fours and inch airspace in between and a single layer gypsum board on each side and bath on one side, that gets you up to 56. The code, the building code requires 50. So th this, this is good. But um, a lot of people think that adding another layer in here is just gonna make it better, right? You're adding more mass in there. But what you do, like here you're seeing that that resonance isn't even here. It's not even in the data that we're collecting or considering to determine this STC. It's somewhere at a lower frequency. But when this 
third leaf gets added in here, then it pushes that resonance up to here. So we went from, so they're at 160. We went from 42 down to 24. And the STC went from 56 down to 45. So this is five below what would meet code, just from adding that in. I mentioned I've been working on a project just the last couple of weeks, and um, it's, a, it's a fairly common thing where a, a partition like this will get designed, and then the structural engineer comes along and says, you need to have sheathing in there for structure. And the, then conversations will come up about the constructability of it all, and it gets decided that it's better to put the sheathing in here. That structural sheathing in here so th this will happen all the time and like we just demonstrated it's a huge reduction in the transmission loss it takes you from something that easily satisfies co code to something that's not even close so here we have some design notes to lower the mass airspace mass you can increase the cavity depth or you can increase mass one and mass two here, so we have the, the prime window, just meaning this here, which is half inch insulating. So you have eight inch monolithic, quarter inch airspace, eight inch monolithic glass, half inch insulating window assembly. And that produces 28. That would be this one. And here you see that resonance way up here. If, if you put, so this is called an acoustical sash so just another glass sheet um, quarter inch laminated and it's one and a half inches in and three inches in and that improves the STC from 28 to 39 and then to 42 so he, we would have a mass airspace mass resonance here that one's still there but because we also have this here since we have two completely different mass airspace mass resonances, it kind of blends them together. One stops the other. So you can play with, with this. Like say, you know, this is what was designed. This is what happened. The solution might just be that you take this layer off, fur it out quite a bit so you have a significantly different depth here than you do here, and then put it back on and maybe put two layers on. Um, so you have one mass airspace mass here and a significantly different mass airspace mass here, and that resolves it. Here is a typical detail for a studio window. And here is a even or an additional couple of things that can be done to really improve the sound isolation. So the first one is bury the depth. So note, these two layers are slanted. If you've ever been in a studio, you've probably noticed this is a fairly common thing. One, it not only deflects reflections down, so you're not getting flutter echoes back, and so you're creating a reflection-free zone at the mixed position, but it also, you're going to have one mass airspace mass resonance here, and you're going to have a different mass airspace mass resonance up there. And that will instead of just having one strong resonance, it just kind of spreads it out. So it's weak over a wider frequency range, and that, that helps. And if you make mass one not equal to mass two, there are, there are advantages and disadvantages of that, but the, um, the advantages are greater. So, the, so we're, we're going to get to region three. You'll see that having those different masses can produce an overall reduction of region three. But usually we're not too worried about region three. Usually that's, you really have high levels of transmission loss up there. Um, but the, the main thing that it does is, if you remember the coincidence dip from the last slide, that by having the, the two different thicknesses, we have two different critical frequencies. So it again kind of spreads those out. So they're, they're less impactful over a wider frequency range. And that, that's helpful. So 
those are some useful tips for maximizing sound isolation. So we'll talk about that region three just briefly. We, um, so th this is just about these resonances here. So the, these resonances, I guess the reason why I put this in here is that I wanna show that these resonances aren't the coincidence dip. These ones are, um, they're related to the wave number times the cavity depth. They occur when the tangent of that wave number times the cavity depth is equal to zero. So there's kind of harmonics of that happening. And it's just, it's less pronounced effect than other resonances. If you, if you look at a sound isolation test, see this pretty strongly, you'll see like the, the elbow, the, the knee, I guess, and you'll see a coincidence dip, but usually these you don't see so much. But we'll, we'll learn how to calculate those anyways. So here, actually this, this shows that. So we have, in this particular one, you, we have the mass, airspace mass resonance. It probably occurs somewhere right between octave bands. So we see a dip, but we're not seeing that, that really sharp spike. Sometimes if it, if it lines up right with one of these dots, you'll see a really sharp drop. But if it's more in between them, it kind of blends into the rest. We have that region one, mass airspace mass resonance, region two, and we have the resonance, the cavity thickness resonance, and then we have the region three, and we're seeing that coincidence dip from the critical frequency that we studied with the single plates. It's not from the, um, from that, depth, this wave number times cavity depth resonance. But we should know how to calculate that. So maybe we don't need to know it, but I, I was, I, I want to put an equation for it. The book doesn't even provide an equation for it, but it states it happens when that K times D equals one. So I just went through deriving that resonance frequency based on what's said here. So angular frequency is two pi f. So if we want to get this in terms of frequency in hertz, then it's gonna be the angular frequency divided by two pi. And then k equals the angular frequency, the wave number equals the the angular frequency divided by the speed of sound. So if we move this over here and then put that K of C in for that, then we get this. And um, oh, the so I, I think we're using this relation to get it to. You, you could use either one of these. We're using that relation to get it to the, the depth in the bottom. If we took K, it'd be equal to one over D. So we replace K with one over D. So you could use either one of those. Now, region one. So in this one, we just have one equation. The transmission loss is going to be equal to 20 times log 10, the sum of the two masses times the frequency minus 48. It's pretty similar to the, the mass law for the single panel, where, and th essentially those two masses are just working together like a single leaf. And then as we go up to region two, past the mass airspace mass resonance, this is, like I said, way back then when um, we first looked at that figure, that essentially it's, that region is going to be the sum of the resonance, or sorry, not the resonance, the sum of the sound reduction for each leaf. Um, so that's what this is. 
if you if you remember, we're using that equation for the sound reduction based on that mass plus the sound reduction based on the other mass. And then we do have this other term in here too with the wave number and the depth of it. So here we're generally getting a plus 18 decibel increase per octave. Region three, here we're getting, so again, we're getting the sound reduction from mass one, the sound reduction from mass two, and then we just get plus six decibels instead of the other term. And this one ends up being 12 decibels per, per octave instead of 18. But those are the general equations for those three zones. I, I should mention that all these equations are pretty, um, let's say they're like introductory. There's, you, you can find references that get into a lot more detail about other things that affect it. And that's what my next few slides are. So. There are other additional factors that can affect the sound transmission loss. The different types of sound absorption in the cavity is important. I'll, I'll go through each of these on the, the next slides. Um, and then resiliency between leaves is important too. You get to see a bunch of examples of that. And then different stiffness or dampening, damping in the leaves. That's really important. And th these equations that we have here don't really account for those other variables. If you wanted to um, get a reference that does dig into those a little deeper, there's the um, it's an architectural acoustics book. I, have, it, I forget, right now I'm forgetting the author of it, but it's the same one that we were looking at for the how the sound pressure and the sound velocity changes as we move away from a reflecting surface. Just blanking at this moment for the author of that book. But um, in any case, if you really want to know that, ask me or, or look through one the old the lecture where we covered that and you'll, you'll get the, the author of that book. He has some more, more complicated equations that can account for some of the the different um, things like resiliency between leaves or damping in the leaves. I will say that a lot of the times test data of assemblies is really what you want to go off of instead of trying to predict it theoretically. That, so the ideal is you have a test or you can have a, you have a test that's close and you can kind of make some adjustments based off a of theory to get to where you need to be. That's that's the ideal. There, there, you you could create really detailed programs using these equations and those other ones that I mentioned, and um, get you know, really close on some assemblies in the ballpark and others. You know, with with these ones, we've learned there's going to be some where you're going to see some pretty big differences between field tests or laboratory tests and and these equations. If you incorporated all those other things that we have here on the screen, you, you should get pretty close. There, there is a, a software package that has done that called Insole. And there, you know, I, I think it's a great tool. I, I've noticed even that will be off, you know, the theory will be off from actual tests by fair amounts at times, but it is a good tool. And that, I think, incorporates all the, the best theory that's available at the moment. Insole, that's the name of that one. But let's, let's get to those, those different characteristics that affect the transmission loss. So with all three of these slides, we're, so first we're talking about the insulation that fills the cavity. We're starting with the best, and then as we go clockwise, we get go down in quality. So mineral wool is the best. Fiberglass is a close second. Mineral wool often will produce maybe a decibel or two more of transmission loss 
and fiberglass. But fiberglass is still pretty good. Then the like closed cell spray or rigid, which is essentially the same thing. It was just done in a factory and then sent out. Those are much less, or they result in a significantly lower sound isolation. So you, you want to steer people towards mineral wool if possible, and then fiberglass as a second, but as a second almost as good choice. You want to try and stay away from the the closed cell stuff. And then we talked about resiliency between the two layers. So the best is just going to have no contact. You have two separate stud sets, and there, there's just an open space in between. Nothing between the two sides is touching. Next best would be an isolation clip. So all the, whatever your leaf is, it gets attached to this and that hat channel. So, so this is a hat channel. It's a pretty light gauge metal. You can see if you look at the section, it's shaped like a hat. That sits here in neoprene. And so th this is, you're essentially like putting vibration isolators in there between the two sides. This one's pretty good. It, um, it's pretty easy to install and it's hard to install it incorrectly. Then resilient channel kind of does the same concept. It's still, you have this light gauge metal that's flexible, but it attaches directly to the studs and this one actually is pretty easy to screw up. A lot of times, contractors installing it won't do it right. They'll screw the gypsum board into the sheet or into the, the studs, and they just short circuit any resiliency that that would have provided. And then, still going down the line, metal stud would be next. Um, if you had pretty light gauge, like 25 gauge, um, this actually provides quite a bit of resiliency between the two sides, but you go towards a heavier gauge. So, so say if it's a taller wall or it's structural or something like that, you have to go to some heavier gauge, then it, it won't provide resiliency between these two sides. And that's similar to a wood stud. It's just rigid through it. And then finally, incorporating, instead of just being a stiff monolithic layer, incorporating some kind of damping into it would help a lot. Um, Quiet Rock is just an off-the-shelf product that you can buy that. that. That would probably be the top of the line in this category. Green glue kind of works like that layer in the middle. Um, you just glue two sheets of gypsum board together and it stays resilient. So it allows some resiliency in between the two sides. Incorporating mass loaded vinyl in there. So here you're still screwing the drywall into the studs. So there's short circuiting of it, but you have this massive limp layer in there that, that helps a lot. Then gypsum board would be the next down the line. You're, like this is going to be pretty stiff, um, but it's not quite as stiff as plywood, which I put at the bottom. I try to stick here with kind of common building materials. Plywood would be the worst. It's lighter weight and stiffer. That's it. We're we're still going to have some other lectures on sound isolation, but that's it for now.